Hi, welcome everybody. As you come in, there's a quick welcome poll just so that we know who's here tonight, but we are excited to have you. Uh, we're gonna give everybody a few minutes to trickle into the room and then we'll get going. Hi, if you're just joining, welcome. Uh, there is a welcome poll as you come in, just so we know who's here. We can tailor things a little bit better that way um, and just give us a minute or two while everybody comes into the room and then we'll get going. All right, well, we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Natalie Gallagher. I am the president of Guidewell Education, uh, which is the parent company of Apple Ruth Summit and ESM Prep. So just this consortia of, of really fabulous education companies kind of across the US uh, and worldwide. And if you came to us from one of those and you're wondering, what is Guidewell? Am I in the right place? Yes, you are. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk with Rick Clark. We're so excited to welcome him. And we're going to talk about college admission. Uh, so I'm excited to announce our speaker, Rick Clark. He is co-author of The Truth About College Admission, A Family Guide to Getting In and Staying Together. Uh, he also leads a podcast by the same name, and the book is now in audio form. So if you're not a big paper book reader, you can listen to it uh, while you're doing errands or jogging or whatever else you want to do. Uh, Rick has been at Georgia Tech for the past 20 years. Uh, he was director of undergraduate admission until 2022 and currently serves as Georgia Tech's executive director for strategic student access. Before joining Tech, Rick worked in admissions at Georgia State and Wake Forest University, so he brings us a wealth of experience from the college admissions side of the table. Uh, Rick, thank you for joining us tonight. Absolutely. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. So quick, uh, let me move us forward here. Just quick agenda. It's very bare bones. Uh, we did the introductions piece. We're going to spend the first 40 minutes or so just having a discussion with Rick about undergraduate admissions in 2024. What is he seeing? What do you need to know? What's uh, important? Maybe what's changed since the last time, if you have older children or if the last time that you went through this was when you went through this, what, what do you need to know that's different now? Uh, and then we will reserve about 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. So please throw your questions down in the, there's a box. Uh, if you look in the, the bottom, uh, you should be able to see the Q&A, throw your questions in there. We will get to them at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see Rick and we will dive right in. So <clears throat> Rick, I wanted to start. I'm curious about the subtitle of your book, A Family Guide to Getting In and Staying Together. Obviously, the college process can be a source of tension for families. So what do you see amongst the families who navigate this process without ruining the relationship? Like what's the yeah, secret? Absolutely. Um, well, again, you know, thanks for, thanks for having me and looking forward to not only our conversation, but being able to take some questions from folks later. Um, you know, if it had been up to me, we would have just titled the book, a family guide, <laughs> um, to staying together, you know, um, but I didn't get to make that call in the end. So, um, <laughs> I guess the reason we wrote the book and the reason I think that subtitle is important is, yeah, over 20 years of this cycle, right, watching it sort of repeat itself over and over again, um, I've seen it go really right and also really catastrophically wrong between families. And I just feel like in the end, so many of the folks, anybody that's on this call tonight, like the spoiler alert is like your kid's going to go to college. If they're going to get in and they're going to end up being fine, it's going to all go well. But nobody seems to really want to believe that. And there ends up being a lot of consternation and anxiety and stress, you know, kind of along the way. And so we wrote this. My co-author is on the high school side. So he's he sees on the ground the families working through the college admission experience. And then I'm at that intersection and the handoff to having them come to college. Um, and so we thought, you know, we can really try to give folks better questions to ask, conversations, starters to have, 
and more than anything, just like perspective. And so that's really what it's all about is let's take all the things that we see that are good and all the things that we see are healthy and then try to deliver that in a, in a kind of readable, digestible way and walk people through what we don't call a process, what we call more of an experience. Uh, and I think that, you know, is, is really the crux of it. So um, as a, as a starter, anyway, that's a, uh, that's a primer. Great. So if you were giving advice to a parent who's, who's sitting at the front end of this um, experience, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what would you tell them? What's the like single nugget that you would provide them to get through the other side still on good terms with their kid? Well, let's see my, I guess one of those would be, so I, I mean, I have the privilege, I would say of teaching college students, employing college students and just being surrounded by them all the time. And so as a parent, many of whom I would guess that are on this tonight went to college themselves. Um, I think my, one of the big pieces of advice is like, keep the end in mind, like this is going to end up at college. And so remember your college experience and think about what makes a good college student, like good college students are curious. Uh, they listen, they ask questions. They don't, they usually like test assumptions instead of just like having a foregone conclusion. And also like, if you think back in the magic that is college, it was never scripted or planned. And so people love to try to like figure out a formula and the, and again, a quote process, tell me the recipe, what's the secret sauce? Like the girl down the street did it this way, just follow her lead. And that's just never how it works out. And so I think that if you can keep the end in mind, as a parent and remember that, you know, if you think like a college student, think back to that and approach it that way. I think that's one, um, probably my biggest message. And we could just cut the webinar af after this is, uh, you know, my sky banner message to parents is parents of high school students should talk to fewer parents of other high school students about college admission and more parents of current college students or recent college grads. Because you talk to a parent of a current college student and they say things like, man, like it, it, it worked out. Like I didn't think she would end up going to X university, but she did. She loves it. Um, or, you know, I never, this wasn't even on his list as a junior. And it, here's how it all kind of shook out and happened. And now he's really doing good. And he's dating a girl we like and has an internship lined up and like life is good. But what you don't hear him say is like, man, you know what I wish we had done is like drank more and stress more and bit our nails more and worried more and lost more sleep. Like that's what we should have done. That would have made things better, you know? And so I think that as parents, like I have, you know, middle school, high school, as you come into those ages, you're always asking people a chapter ahead of you for advice. Keep doing that. I think instead of talking to your peers, Now's the time to talk to, again, keep talking to people a chapter ahead. That's, you're right. We could end it now. I <laughs> can't go home, everybody. <laughs> no, I think that's great advice. Um, look, since we're talking about tension and biting our nails more and stressing more and sleeping less, um, I, I want to address the elephant in the room early, which is college has gotten so expensive. I mean, there's some yeah. schools that have sticker price over $85,000 a year all in. Yeah. Uh, and most families, most of us can't float a check for $85,000 for one year, um, knowing that there's three, at least three behind it. So how do you recommend families navigate the financial piece of it? And when in the, when in the experience, should they yeah. think about it? Do you look and see the sticker price and say, okay, I'm not like, don't apply there. Or do you wait until the end and you get the FAFSA, like see where you get in, you get the FAFSA filled out, you see what aid looks like, you start having the conversation then kind of how does that play into the process and when? Yeah, great. So I think somewhere between the two poles that you explained or you you articulated, I think that um, you're right. Like as parents, it's easy for us to feel like the gift I want to give my kid is being able to say to them, and we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, like, I want to be able to pay for what you want, sweetheart. Like I want, you know, the best school you get into, or if you get into your quote top choice, like we want to make that happen. And, and I think that that concept of like, it's an open checkbook and we'll make it work and we'll take a second mortgage out and never take vacation again and work till we're 78. Like, no, you know, I think that that's, 
that's a misguided desire. Um, it stems from love and I get that. But I think the better advice and the bigger hope that I would have for parents is to have, instead of that open checkbook, like open conversations, like open, honest conversations about money early. So early being before they apply, right? It, it, it could be as early as a junior year where you say things like my father-in-law said to his three kids, which was, and my, my wife grew up in, in North Carolina. And he basically said, listen, I will pay for any public school in the state of North Carolina or any college around the country for public North Carolina prices plus $10,000 a year. And anything over that, that's on you, right? So my wife went to Chapel Hill. Uh, her sister went to Clemson, right? In a Carolina, but not North Carolina. And she, but she knew before she applied that, you know, X plus 10 and anything beyond that was on her. And she did take loans, you know, as a result. Um, where we see it go wrong. And so that's that's the right way. And I think that makes sense. That's a that's a limitation and a condition that's a, that's also backed up by like, and here's why, right? I'm not just arbitrarily saying this. Like his thing was like, we want to still be able to take vacations too and not just pay for college. Um, kind of like the house poor thing, right? Um, and so I think that um, where it goes wrong is right now, seniors right now, where no conversation happened. The kid gets in. And there are, I've talked to families sometimes who have literally said, I'm hoping they don't get in because we can't afford it. Or we don't know how we're going to pay. Like you don't want to be there, right? I think our kids can handle more than we give them credit for. So having that early conversation, because the conversation I'm in every year in March or April is um, they didn't have the conversation. The kid got in. They literally show up in your office. They're wearing the hoodie. They've already posted on all social media that they're going. And like one parent is blowing their nose into the financial aid letter. And it's just like, it's ugly. And nobody wants to be there. Nobody wants to be there. And so I think that that's the way to go. Um, the quick tactical things, that's a little philosophical. The quick tactical things were the price is not really the price usually. And that's important to know. So let's say Wake Forest, where I used to work, you know, I don't know where they are now, but let's call it high 70s. I think that's probably fair. That does not mean you're definitely paying high 70s. <clears throat> what I would say is, and there's some caveats to this, but all schools in the country have a net price calculator. And if you Google net price calculator and the school you're interested in, it should come up pretty easily. You put in your best accurate information, assets and salary and whatever it asks for, tax information essentially. It will give you a pretty decent idea of people, quote, like you who have gone there and basically what they've paid. Not perfect, but it's a good sense, right? I think that's a, a great place to start. Um, and so I would say if you kind of apply those two general principles, it's going to give you a good sense. So visit, great. Um, you know, research it, great. Apply if a conversation has happened, but do not allow an application until that financial conversation has happened. And, and I think it's also okay to come back and say, listen, yes, we will pay for that um, school that costs 78,000 if it comes in at your number, right? 46 or 32 or whatever it is. And here's how, here's how we as a family also feel about loans and why. And here's what your life would look like if you take on loans and, and why, right? So I think always following those numbers up with rationale is really important. Awesome. No, I love the idea of, you know, have the conversation first, even if it doesn't keep you from applying. Because I think sometimes parents see the price and it keeps them, they like, they don't send it, their kid doesn't send in the application. Uh, yeah. And I've talked to, I've talked to admissions people before who were like, gosh, I wish that person would have sent in an application because they were never going to pay. You know, like you said, the price is not the price. Like they were never going to pay what they saw in the brochure. Yeah. Um, so. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, okay. I'm going to pivot us a little bit um, and kind of ask you to get out your crystal ball and do some, you know, oh. looking into the future for us. Okay. Uh, so we've all seen the news come out recently, or many of us have seen the news come out recently about uh, the, the swing amongst some schools back towards test required, right? We've, we've had Brown and Yale and Dartmouth, and then most recently University of Texas at Austin yeah. um, all come back and say, okay, COVID is over. And 
so we're, we're sunsetting our test optional policies. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about, well, is this the start of an avalanche? Is this a wave? Is test optional here to stay? Is it leaving? Um, what do you think? What are you hearing? What do you see? Yep. So I'm like, I'd say I'm a good 50% on crystal ball predictions. So, you know, just I'll give that caveat. Like, um, I could probably dig up an article and put it in here because I got asked a couple of years ago to write uh, for, I don't know, some publication about making predictions. And I was like, I was about 50%. So, so here you go. On testing, though, I have a pretty high level of confidence. So this would be like if I was making my brackets, you know, on uh, before Selection Sunday, like who a couple of teams I really thought were going to get in. I feel pretty good about this. Um, I think that it's not an avalanche. Um, I think that the schools that have gone back don't really shock me too much, I guess, with the exception of Brown. Um, that one is a little surprising. Uh, also, the the other one that you mentioned, I thought that was pronounced y'all. So it's pronounced Yale. <laughs> Anyway. Some people say. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that um, like California, right, they've gone totally test free, test free, test blind, whatever you want to call it. Point being, don't send it. We're not going to look at it and all that. If you write in your essay, I also got a 1550, like they're going to redact that out. But like just today, I think University of Utah said we're forever uh, test optional and Michigan, University of Michigan, right, a school that enrolls probably... <laughs> 70 times as many students as five of those others combined, you know, said they're going test optional. I think that for the next couple of years, it's just going to be like this. I think it's going to be noisy because, I mean, hopefully people are really doing their due diligence, like really doing what they said they were going to do, which is we're going to look at our institution and our data and make the best decisions for our campus. And as a student and a parent, that's like kind of frustrating because like, oh man, just tell me like, can't I just do it like one way for everybody? And the answer is no. Um, but the also the answer is in a way like that's a good thing because I also work for the State Department. I get to go to embassies and consulates around the world. And in doing that and kind of representing American higher education, like it's made me appreciate that America is really weird when it comes to college. We just do this whole thing very differently. I'm sure there's some people on the call who may have gone to, to um, college overseas and, and they know like we're different, right? And the, the diversity of our higher education system is why schools are gonna continue to make different decisions because they're not all the same and it's not one process and it's not one size fits all. So I don't see a big avalanche back. I think the South, Publix in the South just doesn't surprise me at all, especially healthy states that are gaining population. So Texas, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, those school, those states are all growing. And so that doesn't surprise me. But the fact that Alabama and Auburn, as an example, or South Carolina, like some test optional, those states are not really growing population wise. And so it helps them. And it makes kind of, to me anyway, institutional sense. I'm not saying they would never go back. But I see why they haven't. And then hopefully they're also looking at their data to say, well, it might just not be predictive for us. Like we might be able to get what we need from the other things. Rigor of curriculum, probably stuff we're going to talk about in a little while. So I guess my that was the long answer. My short answer is expect noise, expect variance. And um, I also think expect this to slow down um, because I do think all these announcements that are happening right now. Like that's going to stop and people are going to have their decisions made. And so if you're a rising senior, don't expect things to get all, you know, weird um, late summer or right before you apply or after you apply. That is not going to happen. Um, this is the right time, the appropriate time for schools to be making these decisions. So it's a good thing and not a, um, don't let it kind of freak you out because it's a logical time to make these announcements. Perfect. So if you're a rising senior, I want to make sure that a rising seniors, if they're out there and they're worried and they're listening to you, Rick, that they that they're hearing that yes, there might be some announcements that come out in the next several weeks about schools that are on your list, but you do not need to worry that in October, after you've submitted, they're going to change their policy and you're going to find yourself up a creek. No. Right. right. In fact, I will give every if that happens, I'll give a full refund to what people paid to to be part of this webinar. I'll double it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll 
awesome. Um, okay, great. And then for our underclassmen who are listening, uh, I, I would just say that because it is so noisy, um, don't rely on what your older friend says about whether or not a school requires testing or what your older sibling did or whatever. Like these policies yeah. are changing and they're changing per school and per year. And so just because something was true a year ago doesn't necessarily mean it'll be true for you. Um, totally. Uh, great. Okay. So. Rick, I want you to take us behind the scenes a little bit. You've sat in on so many admissions committees. You've looked at, I don't know how many thousands of applications. Um, you know, who gets in and why? Like, what's the holistic review process? How's that work? Yep. Um, there's really, the easiest way to think about this, and we do talk about this um, in the book, is there's really two ways that admission decisions get made in the country. Um, one of those is what you would call formulaic admission. And I think that if anybody, um, you know, just like from a sports analogy here, and if you're not a sports person, ask somebody to translate for you. Uh, but, you know, a lot of schools, and, and honestly, when I got to Georgia Tech, we were kind of doing it this way. It's like, it's like the high jump, right? There's a, there's a bar at a certain height, which is driven or dictated by either GPA only, if it is a school that doesn't require testing, or GPA plus testing. And so that's very clear. You jump the bar, you're in. Like you crash into the bar or go under it, that's, you're not in, right? Simple, clear, outward facing. That stuff, people put that on their websites, right? About what they expect. Here in Georgia, I know a lot of people are from all over the country, but like many of our public schools operate this way. So that's formulaic. What happens and what happened to Georgia Tech and, and what happens around the country sometimes is, demand goes up, supply stays relatively flat, and numbers start to fail you. You can only raise that bar so much to where either everybody's clearing it or it feels dumb to just like use numbers anymore, right? Like I'm not going to take somebody because they have a 1480, but or I am taking somebody because they got a 1480 and not taking somebody because they got a 1470. That's absurd. Like they could have like blinked and got the wrong answer or you know, whatever, like, and even the people that make the test would say, don't do that. Like that makes no sense. Um, so schools start to say, all right, well, what else, right? You, you are, you have proven whether it be through testing or GPA or the things that you've taken in school that you're a good student. Right. Um, and maybe we should break that down a little bit, um, to say that one of the things that schools will start with is, you know, where do you go to school? Like that really is question number one. Where do you go to high school? Um, what could you have taken? What did you take? How did you do? How did you do in certain subjects? And how did you do grade by grade? When you talk about holistic review, they take a very deep dive into it. Instead of just like, you have a three eight, I don't care about how what you took, when you took it, how you did, how you got there. No, they're gonna say, okay, a three eight. Well. What did ninth grade look like? What did 10th grade look like? You know, you're applying for uh, political science. Like, how are you doing in these particular classes? And maybe they care less about these other classes, right? Every school does that a little bit differently. But when you have a supply and demand problem, that's really where you start. And a lot of people, you know, always think, <laughs> um, oh, well, you know, I heard it's easier to get in from like the school down the street. Like there's always this evil school down the street where it's easier and everybody gets in, but your school is somehow screwed because you have like a certain curriculum or a certain grading scale or whatever. We don't try to compare schools to each other. We, we look at your school. What it, could you have taken? What'd you take? How'd you do? When'd you do that? Um, and the truth is that a lot of pretty selective places, like you pretty much are like, yeah, check, check, check. They're a good student. They took good classes. And you start to add factors. And so the, the high jump all of a sudden becomes like women's all around gymnastics, where there's like multiple events, some of which are very humanly judged. Like, well, let's look at what you did outside the classroom. Like, you know, are you involved? Are you having an impact on people around you? Are you having an influence in your school community? Like fundamentally, when you graduate, will you be missed? You know? Um, by a coach, by a teacher, whatever. Um, you can demonstrate that lots of different ways. 
And so then schools just sort of start adding layers to say, like, they want to know maybe an interview at some places or how you express yourself in writing, you know, that kind of thing. Recommendation letters, like an adult in one school community talking to an adult in another school community and probably saying things that a 17 year old doesn't even think or know about themselves. That's helpful to to get. And so that's sort of like the components of what we're reviewing and like what holistic review really means. Um, and I guess we could talk about any piece of that if you'd like, but I guess the other piece I would just say is that's all true. That is all true. How admission decisions get made is sometimes while connected to that, not exactly like, well, this kid did the most stuff outside the classroom and therefore they get in. So there's something that you'll hear people call like institutional priorities, but I think it's better to just call it mission. Like what is the mission of the school? And so I'll use my alma mater because I feel like they're a great example of this. Um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So 82% of UNC students must come from the state of North Carolina by law. 18% from outside the state. Meaning that, you know, it's going to be easier to get in from North Carolina than from out of state. There's more applicants from out of state and there's fewer spots. So that's your supply and demand. But also like, yeah, fundamentally, while that other stuff matters, a kid from Atlanta could have higher test scores and better classes and all the things we said we care about and matter and not get in. And then some fine, good, perfectly normal kid from Charlotte does get in. Uh, while not fair, it is logical, right? It's mission driven. And so I think that that's for parents, especially really helpful to know, because then what we have to tell our kid is like, you've, there's nothing that you didn't do that you left on the table. There's nothing, they're not judging you and your future potential. It feels that way. I get it at the kitchen table or in the living room. It can feel that way. But the truth is that decision was made because you don't have an NC after your name, after your zip code, right? And you can't control that. So let's talk about the things you can control. I think, I think for parents, that's that's our job, right? We're supposed to be, we're we're perspective coaches. And we got to try to help 17-year-olds zoom out um and see a bigger picture. That's the gift that we can really give. As someone who has a 17-year-old, well, now 18-year-old under her roof right now. I I really appreciate that perspective. Um great. I want to I want to circle back to something that you talked about, which was the three eight and the, the idea that like not all three eights are the same, right? Yeah. That they can tell a different story. Um and you know one of the things that we sometimes hear people ask about or wonder about is hey my kid had a tough season for X, Y, or Z reason. Maybe it was they got to high school and realized that they didn't know how to study and freshman year was tough. Maybe it was, hey, we had this like traumatic thing happen in our family or we had this mental health crisis or this yeah. this physical health crisis or whatever it is and their grades took a dip. Do you explain those things? If so, how do you just let the transcript speak for itself? How do you how do you navigate when the transcript is is a little bit up and down? Yeah. That's a great question. There is a section on the Common App and most, um, which I should, let me just explain, because I think we have some like ninth grade families and others who may not be familiar. The Common Application is basically just that. About a thousand schools in the country use it. Um, so many schools um, have their own or maybe a statewide application. And even with them, they'll usually have a section like what I'm describing um, which is called something like additional information or special circumstances. Um, and a lot of people, there's a lot of consternation <laughs> from families, you know, parents and students like, should I use this? Like, you know, I got mono, I missed two months of my sophomore year. And that's why I got two C's. Like, do I put that on there? And here's how we read it. So I think this is helpful to flip it around and be like, let me tell you how we read that. We read an application looks like a form <laughs> because it's got a lot of like lines on it and boxes. But, and so I get that it feels for me. It looks like a driver's license application or a job application or something. But 
That is not how it is read by an admission person. It is read more like a story. And if you can put your put yourself in the shoes or in the mind of an admission person, a kid might take two months to fill out an application. They come back to it, they revisit it, and then they finally submit it. We're reading that in, you know, probably first read through 15 minutes, right? As a story that builds on itself. And so you've got where you're from and you know where your parents work and where they went to school. You've got the academic piece. You've got essays and stuff. Like we want chapters, right? If you feel like that special life event is part of the story, a significant part of the story that you want to make sure that they are aware of, you should put it there. Mom and dad got divorced in the ninth grade. It was a freaking train wreck. We moved. Like all this kind of stuff happened. I want you to know about that. Um, that's not an excuse. Like you're just explaining it. The way that's read is we read it one of two ways. Either, oh man, that's that's of note. Let me let me let me reread now that I know this what they're talking about. Or, eh, that doesn't. Okay, fine. Like that doesn't really change anything about how I was already reading this story. But you know you put it down. And so they're, it's never going to be to your disadvantage. I would just say that's the filter I would use. Do I want them to know? To the extent it's going to be relevant, to the extent that they're going to weigh it in, you'll never know. But you'll at least know, yep, I, th I wanted that to be part of my story. I believe it's a significant part. I'm putting it down. People think that way about um, ADHD or, you know, there's a lot of people that have those kind of questions too. Like, for some kids, that is a big part of who they are and it, they couldn't put it anywhere else. So they put it there. For other kids, it's like, nah, I don't really, you don't need to know that that's kind of part of my, my life and my journey. And I'll leave it out. Not, neither of those are wrong, right? It's, that's a very personal decision. Awesome. The other thing that you mentioned is, you know, you mentioned looking at kids within the context of their school. What classes yeah. did they take? What was available to them? And what did they take? Um, and one of the things I hear families ask about a lot or wonder about a lot is, you know, honors versus AP versus dual enrollment versus IB is one better than the other. You know, what should we do? Kind of how do we decide the rigor? And then also how much rigor is enough rigor, right? Like, am I, if I, do I need to take every AP that's offered or do I need to take every IB class that's offered? Um, how do you answer those questions? Yeah, so I think that the first way I would start is generally speaking, the, the answer is, this is like the beauty of working in college admission. <clears throat> you can almost answer every question with, it depends, and then just like walk away. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Um, but it does depend, right? I mean, I'm thinking about where I live here in the Atlanta kind of metro area. And I can think of some schools, you know, around here, mainly mainly public schools around here, um, where I know from reading applications, and you can sort of tell from the type of students in that school that the quote unquote more rigorous path through is by staying in the school and taking the AP class. I can think of another school a couple miles away from here, though, where that's not true. Actually, the tougher route is going to the local college and taking the equivalent class, right? And at the end of the day, that family knows and that kid knows, like, what is going to be best preparation for them and what's going to be, like, pushing and stretching themselves appropriately versus like ducking away from it, you know? And the, and the truth is like at many colleges, they don't care. Like that's impressive to them and they're thrilled. At a very small subset of schools, they are making those type of like delineations and maybe looking at prior years applicants from that high school or asking some real questions to figure out like, well, okay, we got 20 kids applying. The top of the cohort seems to be Really, this is like what's the true kind of toughest path through versus, you know, this. But I think students need to make that decision based on um, what their aspirations are and honestly what they can handle. Like, I mean, now again that I have a high school student, especially, I mean, this is so real to me and just so relevant to what we're talking about. Like, can, are at the end of the day, the goal is to end up on a college campus somewhere prepared, 
healthy, having actually learned the information so you can then use that. And going forward, instead of like not sleeping and stressing yourself out and all the things, right, of like sort of overloading in 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 many cases, I think not absorbing a lot of that information. So let me tell you how we've um, engineered for that at Georgia Tech and how not everybody, but a lot of schools have. We used to literally count the number of, let's say, APs or IBs or dual enrollment classes and not necessarily differentiate so much. Now what we do is more like kind of like bands. Like this kid took five to nine. Like this kid took 10 to 13. Well, at some places you can't do that. So you'll never see that in the band. But I think that's our way of sort of saying like, okay, it's not about six versus seven. It's about like, generally speaking, this is this is kind of where they fell. The other thing that we do is, and this is not atypical for Georgia Tech, a lot of schools do that. And we put this in the book to give people a sense. We sort of do an evaluation of their rigor and we put that on a rubric, right? So the idea is like, let's, I'm going to make up some numbers and some words here, but not making up words, but descriptions. Um, a four could be like, this is a kid who they not only took kind of everything they could in the high school, but maybe they even pushed themselves a little beyond that. A three is a student who really, you know, maximized the curriculum, a two, and you can kind of see how it cascades down. So when you read, you have this idea of like a rigor rating, and then also maybe a band count, and you're getting a pretty good sense of that. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's sort of how I would tell people to approach it is like, you know, okay, they're, they're giving some, this isn't like so draconian and bean counting, you know, they are sort of giving some grace and, and again, context, um, to everything. So hopefully that's helpful. That's very helpful. Um, it is, I want, um, I'm going to ask one more like brass tax question and then we'll probably switch. We've got so many questions that have flooded in from people who are watching. So I want to leave time for that. Um, but just very, very practical. So there's all these different ways. And I know we've, we do, we have some underclassmen parents who maybe haven't gone through the process. Um, so I'll try not to use the jargon, but there are all kinds of deadlines around college admissions, right? You can play early decision, early action, regular decision. There's rolling decisions. There's a single choice early action. There's all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, but once you've picked one, so if you're going to apply early action, for example, does it matter? It, the deadline is the deadline. You can't be late. That's does true. it matter if you apply early in that process, uh, right at the deadline, like how much, oh, it, you know, uh, does it impact you at all? Okay. So, so you, you <laughs> sort of like put this on a real calendar, let's say there's a November one deadline and your question is, um, am I at a disadvantage? Are they going to read me differently? If I apply on November one at 1159 PM, my, uh, my time zone, <laughs> Or I applied on like September 18th. Is that what you're asking? Exactly. Are, are the spots all going to be gone or are they going to yeah. read me differently? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I would say that 99% of the time, it makes no difference whatsoever. With the one exception being like, when you talk about rolling, right? I mean, rolling means... Um, there isn't really a deadline in some ways. It's like you just apply and then they put out decisions. I mean... I guess theoretically you could end up in a spot where maybe, you know, they've they've filled their class or whatever. But for most of these schools that probably the people on this call are talking about where there's a firm like early action, right, which is non-binding, early decision, which is binding. And they have November 1, very common, January 1, very common, you know, these type of deadlines. The answer is absolutely not. Um, you know, we kind of like it that they come in early because it helps us spread our reading out a little more. But the truth is like, if you came on to the call tonight and you're like, my biggest worry is, you know, I need to know whether or not procrastination is still alive and well among American youth. Like it is, you know, don't worry about that. Um, we do a <coughs> account. We got about 60,000 applications this year. We have four deadlines throughout the process. And I think half, maybe, at least half of our applications came in either on the deadline day or the day before the deadline. So there's definitely no advantage. Nobody's going to be judging you. Like, apply when you feel ready, but you're probably ready to turn it in before you 
think you are. You're just holding it on because you don't want to let it go. You know. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Rick. We're going to switch because there's so many questions that are just pouring in. So please uh, keep keep passing them. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, and, you know, and then we'll, we'll and then have we'll to not. save, then we'll have to <laughs> save some of them for next time. Um, but also I think Whitney's going to do, going to send another quick little poll. Um, hopefully this has been helpful and will continue to be helpful for the next 20 minutes. Um, you know, we try to put out lots of good information. Uh, and so if you, you know, want additional information or follow up about your specific student and their need and, and, you know, want any help with anything, we'd be happy to do that. Um, but let's, um, one of the questions was, I think going back to the, the test requirement announcements, um, someone's asking where to look for those announcements. Great. So, um, maybe, um, maybe we could put this one into chat or Q and a, but a great place to go that consolidates these is called fairtest.org, um, F-A-I-R test.org. They have like a, on the top nav, um, there's a tab. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's called test optional or anyway, they keep like a pretty accurate, pretty timely updated list, right? That says, like Georgia Tech happens to be test required, right? So that's in there. It says when we made that announcement, um, you can see all the California schools that are, and, and actually even like sometimes there's links off of it so you can better understand or go right to that school's information. So there's probably other places, but that one jumps immediately to mind as one, um, as one source for that. Because that is better to have it aggregated than to have to go find it all yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Although for sure, once you have your list, if it's, if it's your cycle to apply, once you have your list, go look at each school and see what their current requirements are. Cause they do, they do change, but you're yeah. right. That is good to have it aggregated somewhere. Um, we have somebody asking if colleges look favorably on graduating from high school a year early, or if you don't recommend that. I would say that is, I would not say that colleges look on that favorably. Um, flipping that around, it's not like it's a bad thing, right? But um, very few students are really ready to do that. And I don't know that schools are like necessarily overly impressed um, that a student may graduate early. Obviously, there are rare cases where that's just that's just who that kid is, right? And that's the that's the right thing to do. Um, but but in vast majority of cases, there's value in continuing. Um, you know, even if that means giving yourself some flexibility and freedom to take some different classes or do some dual enrollment, who knows? Um, yeah, that'd be my answer. Great. Um, lots and lots of questions about APs and specifically AP tests, which does not surprise me. They are coming up. They are around the corner. Um, people wondering if the AP tests themselves have significance in the application and if schools, mm -hmm. if particularly competitive schools, are going to care that they took the test as opposed to the class. Yeah, so... Um, Okay, it's a great question. There are some schools where, you know, they don't, they may not teach the AP class, but then a kid can go and take the, the test, right? Um, a lot of students take the class as a senior, and by the time they take the test, admission decisions have already been made. So we're really only talking about, you know, I guess some freshmen, but largely sophomores and juniors where, you know, they take the class for the test and they send it in. Here's a couple of things to know about that. There are some schools, I feel like y'all, um, again, you said Yale, but I think y'all is one of those that has said, they're like tests, there's, you know, just as many- flexible, now, yeah. That's flexible. <laughs> there's just as many terms of early, you know, deadline names as there are testing policies. But um, they, uh, they're they saying, you know, you could, if you'd rather send those instead of uh, SAT, ACT. So, you might see that here and there, right? Where that's an option. That could be a trend that, that or, you know, other schools could jump on that bandwagon. That could happen. But the other thing is um, when, when, okay, so you can list your test scores on your application if you already have them, and that could be of value. Um, the other thing is that when schools are trying to build their applicant, or sorry, their prospect pool, you know, they're trying to, um, they work with the college board who, you know, not only administers the SAT, but also through the AP results. It is a way that we like try to um, license these names and contact information in order to market to and recruit students. 
So that could be another reason why there's value, even if it ends up not having bearing necessarily on the admission decision. Um, and so I guess I would just say, I know there are some schools in some communities where people feel like, okay, I need to just like take every one of these tests, even if I didn't take the class. And I would say, typically that is not going to end up being the thing that is so compelling and, you know, ends up having a major bearing on the admission decision. Um, but those are a couple of the ways that APs in general and AP tests might factor into the overall cycle, including marketing, prospect building, and ultimately, you know, the application itself. Great. Um, I really like this question because I, I think it comes from a well-meaning parent, um, which is when is stretch just too much of a stretch? Like when do you when do you let your kid apply, uh, and when do you advise that they take it off the list? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Well, let, let me start with this. You know, many of my friends who are, um, you know, school counselors, right, in high schools, there's this term that you'll hear out there about building a balanced list. And I think what that means is like, they want to be realistic, right? Um, you want to give yourself choices and options. And I think as parents, like we get that because that's what we want for our kids. Like we want our kids to not have to do things, they to, to be able to get to do things, to be able to choose who they play with or who they date or where they work or all these things. Like we want our kids to have freedom to choose. And that's our job is to try to put them in a position to have choices and options. And I do believe firmly real success as a senior in high school is that you get to pick where you go to school or have a couple places you get to pick between instead of like just one thing. Right. Um, what I would say is, I actually don't think a balanced list is all that important anymore. Like, why do you have to apply to a place that's like a lottery to get in? You know, like if people always are like, yeah, you should have a, a safety school that you know you can get into and a couple that are likely. And then you should have like a couple reach schools like you actually don't need to have reach schools. Like who says you have to apply to a place that's like under a 20 percent or 10 percent admit rate? You know, I think the bigger thing is here's what a parent should never do. And this is a good job as a parent, role as a parent. Never let your kid apply to a place they wouldn't actually go. <laughs> but yet every year you see students where somehow it's like they apply, they, somebody told them they need to apply to 10 places and they put like two other places on their list just because they needed to get to 10 or they knew they could get in, like, but they wouldn't really go there. That is dumb. That just makes no sense. So I think... If you parent them towards when you get into this range and let's just call it 25% admit rate or lower, then you need to be um, understand, like help them understand, like the likelihood is you're not going to get in 75% of people do not let's flip the percentages. Are you okay with that? Like, can you handle that? And how many times can you handle that? Like I can handle that three times. <laughs> All right, so I got three of these places on my list where I would love to go there. I would be excited if I got in. I understand the odds are not in my favor to use some Hunger Games language, um, but but I want to give it a shot. You know, I feel like I've worked hard. I want to give it a shot, and I'm hopeful. But I can handle it if I don't get in. And I think that's what we got to do as parents is help our kids be realistic. And <clears throat> again, I feel like we are coaches in perspective. Like that's that's our job, coaches in perspective. Awesome. Um, we have a lot of people asking about, you know, this for, uh, people who don't live and breathe admissions news all the time, uh, the Supreme court decision, you know, uh, impact came down, you can no longer use race and admissions. So cannot ask about it. Um, and we have a lot of people asking specifically for students of color or gender diversity. Mm -hmm. How do they, how do they highlight that? Should they highlight it? You know, where does it fit in the application process now? Yeah. Great question. So, and I have a slide that I've been using not only with like internal folks at Georgia Tech, but then I've been out on the road presenting this too. It's because there's some confusion around this. When you apply, and if you're a parent of a senior, you know this already, but um, you still indicate your race and your ethnicity. Okay. So you do still see it on the application, just like 
you might say that you're like Methodist or something on the application too. But legally now on the college side, <clears throat> we can't map that data over into our, what we call our reader, what we're seeing on the screen. And so last year we, we could see that a student was, let's say Hispanic, um, that they wanted to study this major, that they're from this place. And we pulled all that data over and we could use that, right? Race is one of many factors. Now, when you apply, you'll still indicate, but then the school doesn't pull that one field into their reader, all right? Um, what I would say is, I think this goes back to the story, right? I think that's the way you have to look at this is, do I believe that my racial identity is a part of the story that I wanna make sure that people are aware of? And if so, then I need to figure out as I look at these chapters, where and how do I wanna ensure that they understand that's part of my story? The logical place there and what um, Judge Katanji Brown talked about was in the essay, that you would have the opportunity to do that. Or many schools have what they call supplemental questions where it's like they get to decide what it is. And that's another opportunity, right? Um, Obviously, in an interview, if somebody is asking questions, you know, it could naturally come up that you want to highlight that and they're making notes. Um, so that is a very personal decision. Honestly, it's it's in many ways, just like what we talked about earlier about the the divorce or the car wreck or the mono or, you know, whatever else it might be. Great. Um, this is an interesting one and one that I'm sure you get at Georgia Tech specifically. Um, so we have a student who says lots of people have suggested that they apply to a different major because it's less competitive and then they transfer into the more competitive major once they get in. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to know, does it make a difference what a major you're applying in? And like, do they take into account your extracurriculars and classes in context of that major? And I feel like you alluded mm -hmm. to that earlier, but wanted Great. to revisit it. Yes, I think that's an excellent question. That's an important question. Um, it really does depend. So the good news is, while America does have over 3,000 schools, you don't have to worry about all 3,000. Like, you in the end just have to worry about your seven or nine or whatever your number is that you're applying to. And that is your job to do your homework and find out. And, and the, here's the thing. It's, people are not like doing weird, like uh, say one thing and then do something different behind the scenes. Schools are very clear about this. If they consider major and if they're enrolling by major, they will make sure you know that. Right. So there are some schools out there who and they'll even put some of that profile on their website where it's like, here's the average test scores or GPA of students in this college within our university. And then here's what it looks like with this college within our university. They'll also indicate what their major changing policies are. And this is really important, right? Because some schools say once you're in, you cannot switch out of that particular major or college. Other schools will say, we don't care. But once you get here, you're going to have to apply to get in, let's say, during your second year to X college or major within our university. And then other schools will say, we don't care ever anyway. Like you come in with what you want. You can switch anytime you want. And we're just glad you're here and you've got complete freedom. But the good news is all of that is made very clear by each individual institution. And, you know, it is your job to do the research, ask the question, and don't feel like they're going to think you're gaming this or whatever. Like, you're just doing your homework, right? You're just doing your research, asking the question. Um, this is not the time to go to Reddit. This is not the time to go to, like, <laughs> some weird, you know, backwater corner of the interwebs. Like, take your question to the college and trust that information. Awesome. Um, all right. We haven't talked tonight about letters of recommendation, but there are questions about them, which is, I mean, basically, how do you pick who writes the letter? Um, are teacher recommendations more important than the counselor letter recommendation? Does it matter which subjects, which teacher, mm -hmm. kind of which years, all those questions? Yeah. So I guess I'll start at the, at the end of your question and say, generally speaking, you would want to have somebody writing who's taught you or coached you or, you know, maybe been a club sponsor or whatever towards the latter part of your high school career. Now, 
it could be awesome if you had somebody who maybe taught you as a freshman and as a junior or senior, like that's great, right? Because they've seen some of your arc and your evolution. Awesome if that's the case. But if you're picking between like a, a person that taught you as a junior versus a freshman, you should go with the person that taught you as a junior. They're talking more relevantly about who you are as a learner heading towards closer to college, right? Um, if you can ever find somebody who can speak to you, again, if this is a story and we're reading the full book, um, you want somebody ideally that can speak to you maybe in a multifaceted way. Like I coached you and I taught you, I was your club sponsor and I taught you, right? That's always a nice person to find. Some schools will be very instructive that they want like core class teachers, right? They don't want somebody who, you know, taught an elective that they want math and science or foreign language and, you know, social studies or whatever, like They'll be pretty clear about that. Um, many times, though, they're going to just say, we would like one or we would like two letters of recommendation. Um, I guess I'll just quickly say what you don't need to do is go find somebody who you made the highest grade in. Like we already have the transcript. So if Mrs. Jones is just going to say, you know, Tommy made the highest grade you can make in my class like we already knew that she's just writing another chapter that we already read so that's a waste right um you want to go to somebody who really can speak to who you are as a learner and who and how you're going to be in our classrooms or on the campus that's the goal of a letter of recommendation awesome um, okay, another one that we really hadn't touched on until now tonight, but lots of people asking about extracurricular activities and, you know, how do they weigh in? Uh, certainly, how do, how are they weighed relative to academics? And, and do you have to, you know, if you're really into your one thing, do you have yeah. to diversify and have more than one thing? Yes. Um, so I would say, don't let anybody tell you um, that like, extracurriculars are more important than academics. You know, you're at the end of the day, like you're not coming to be in the French club. Like you're coming to be a student on that, on that campus. Um, so the first and most important thing is going to be your academics. But again, when we find ourselves in a case of demand far outpaces supply, that is the next most important thing really is what are you doing outside the classroom? Because it says more than just what you did. It's about time management. It's about oftentimes teams, right? Not just sports teams, but like working in groups, like all the things you really do in college, manage your time, invest in other people, like make people around you better. That's why it matters. That's why it's valuable. It is absolutely fine to be, instead of well-rounded, pointy. And it's, it's more likely to be pointy these days than ever before because no matter what you do and i see about 500 people on the call right now people want more of your time than they've ever wanted before if you're really into music they want you all year round to do music if you're really into tennis they want you all year round to play tennis it's harder than ever before to do lots of things so last thing i'll say because i know we're running short on time is we read extracurriculars a lot the way we read essays in that we skim and we start at the top. And usually by the time you hit about the fourth thing, there's not a whole lot of substance there, honestly. And people are kind of checking boxes. So most people have a solid couple at the top and that's the most important thing, right? So put the thing, again, if you think about what do I want them to know in my story and they're, let's just pretend like they're only gonna read the very first line, that's what you put first. A lot of kids stress about which one do I put first? Like think about it that way. If there was only one line, what would you list first? And then what's next? Awesome. Um, all right. Yeah, we are running out of time, but I've got, I think, two questions left for you and we'll wrap up tonight. I so appreciate everybody staying with us. There are still 500 people here, um, which is just incredible. And if we didn't get to your uh, question, I will give you my email at the end. You're welcome to send it in. We will um, try to get you answers might take us a little time if there's a lot of them, but we'll do our best. Um, so we've had somebody ask about uh, the impact of AI on admissions and specifically, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, are you concerned with how students are using AI to write the essays and do you use AI to evaluate the essays on the back end? I'm glad you asked. <clears throat> I've written a lot about this and we've done some podcasts about this so people can definitely find more. The short answer is like, how do we define AI, right? I mean, on the college side. So starting on the college side, you could argue, yeah, 
AI is being used on some level, right? Here's how it's being used and here's how it will continue to be used. What we do right now, and I don't mean just Georgia Tech, like we admission people spend a lot, waste a lot of time <clears throat> going in and looking at transcripts. Like literally, here's what a human will do. They will go in, they will find your uh, highest math class. They will then go to a drop down menu. They will find that math class. And so they'll populate that box, right? Um, so that we know when we read an application that the highest level math this kid took was BC calculus. Um, and then what was their senior math, right? Humans are doing that. That's what AI does really well is it scrapes information. Here's another thing. If you're a parent that's gone through this before, one of the most annoying things out there is a lot of schools have, there's been a proliferation of self-reported academic records where they, they want you to do the work. They want, instead of the transcript, they want you to populate all this stuff. We are coming to a time soon where AI can do that for us and everybody's going to be better off because of it. But what is not happening is we're not just like punching in an algorithm, hitting enter and going to lunch. And that's how we're making our class. Like that's not happening, right? What AI could do going forward though is with letters of recommendation, it could synthesize. It could say, okay, give me the three most relevant bullet points. Like, put this into bullet point form for me or, or pull out these you know, notable quotes. It doesn't mean that letter of recommendation won't later be read, but it could put it into a more readable format. I say that's great. Um, for students, you could go look for Georgia Tech's policy or guidelines on AI. We know it's being used. We're generally fine with that. A really terrible essay would be 100% written by ChatGPT. It's going to be all the things we say is not a good essay. It's not specific. It's not personal. It's all the things. But I do think that AI can and maybe should be used for students as they're brainstorming, as they're you know working through maybe let me test a couple ideas. I'm all for that. Like as somebody that writes a lot, I say, let it work for you and then make it your own. Awesome. And I know, Rick, when we were talking about this yesterday, um, you mentioned a lot of schools are coming out with their own policies and guidelines around yeah. AI. And so I guess the only caveat I would put on that is make sure that you Look follow that. whatever the policy is for your school. 100%. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, then I'm going to share a screen here and um, just make sure everybody, thank you so much for attending. That is my email I'll zoom in so that you've got it it's just natalie at guidewell education if you have additional questions that you want to make sure get answered uh rick unfortunately will not be able to answer them but we will make sure that you get answers um and then rick i just thank you so much for tonight i want to send us out with one question which is you've been doing this for more than two decades now um what's changed hmm. gosh <laughs> somebody asked me for a, a playlist the other day about college admission and my first uh, was REM, it's the end of the world as we know it, um, because I really do think that almost everything has changed, you know, um, in, in in a lot of ways, this, the timeline is a lot earlier, like there's a lot of students that are applying earlier, a lot of people finding out earlier, no doubt. Um, I think, obviously, as you said, the, the cost of college and the conversation about return on investment and therefore the need to have the conversations we talked about earlier, earlier, uh, the money, letting the financial fit be part of the conversation, I think is really critical. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, so we could rattle off all kinds of things, you know, around that, like um, some schools just like radically shifting in terms of their selectivity and all that. But I think let's, let's just say what hasn't changed real mm -hmm. quick. Um, and that is in America right now, over the last five years, it has become easier to get into college, not harder, and that will continue. The average admit rate in America is 65% for four-year universities. Most schools admit most students. And I do think if you, if you do a good job, you can find one where you will be happy, you'll find a best friend for life, you'll find a professor who cares about you, and you can afford to go. And I think that has not changed. I can think of no better way to end tonight uh, than on that note. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Really appreciate the wisdom and advice tonight. Um, take care, everybody. Thanks, Natalie. Bye.